Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Supreme Court orders the High Court rejects multiple abortion cases. We tell you what that means for the pro-life movement. Forced abortion, a shocking new report details how China is forcing sterilization and abortion on minority women. And a mom's peace, how one group is still caring for women suffering from miscarriage amidst the coronavirus. The Supreme Court rejects multiple abortion-related cases and sends them to the federal courts instead after reversing Louisiana's pro-life law last week. The Supreme Court last week instructed federal courts to reconsider two Indiana abortion laws and two buffer zone laws. One Indiana abortion law requires parental consent for minors seeking abortion and the other that mothers receive an ultrasound. The federal courts originally halted these laws, but will now look at them again. Also last week, the Supreme Court said in a written order it would not hear cases from Chicago, Illinois and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where pro-lifers have challenged buffer zone restrictions outside of abortion facilities. These orders came the same week the Supreme Court reversed Louisiana's pro-life law, which required abortion facilities maintain the same safety and health standards as all other surgical centers. Prudence Robertson, communications associate for the Susan B. Anthony List, joins us now via Skype for pro-life analysis. Prudence, welcome. First off, can you give us a quick overview of these two Indiana pro-life laws the federal courts will now reconsider? Of course. So the first is an ultrasound law, and it allows women to view their unborn baby growing inside of them via ultrasound. And, you know, for women, this is so important because the ultrasound often reinforces the humanity of the unborn child and moves a mother to choose life. So, you know, we're in full support of those ultrasound laws. And the second law that the Supreme Court sent back to the Seventh Circuit is a parental consent law, which allows parents the ability to protect their young uh, daughters who are minors from the abortion industry when they might be considering an abortion. It includes parents in that conversation that is life altering mm -hmm. um, and protects young girls from the abortion industry that, that preys upon them time and again. So these are compassionate, important laws that should stand. Prudence, what action then do you expect from the federal courts here in light of the Supreme Court's ruling against Louisiana's pro-life law last week? Right. So, of course, we're very disappointed with that ruling, striking down Louisiana's law that protects women and unborn children from the abortion industry that refuses to regulate itself. Now, the Seventh Circuit ruled these Indiana laws to be unconstitutional because they pose an undue burden on women mm -hmm. seeking an abortion. And that was a precedent founded in Roe versus Wade. Um, but we're encouraged that the Supreme Court has now sent those rulings back to the Seventh Circuit and and ask the federal court to take another look because what that signals to us is that the Supreme Court may have come to a different decision, you know, that these laws might not cause an undue burden. And you know, Catherine, very well as much as I do that they don't pose an undue burden. They protect women from the abortion industry and inform them about what abortion is. So we're encouraged uh, with this. And Clarence Thomas, in his concurring opinion in the Louisiana case, made clear that the abortion precedent found in Roe versus Wade are not uh, constitutional, that they are creations that should be undone. So we hope that the Seventh Circuit takes heed of uh, Justice Thomas's words and really takes a closer look at these decisions and, and rules uh, to uphold these important laws. So that is encouraging insight. And Prudence, the Supreme Court also refused to take on buffer zone cases. Can you explain how these buffer zone laws impact the work of the pro-life movement. Absolutely. So buffer zones, uh, they restrict the pro-life speech of Americans who are working to speak the truth in love to women who are at the door of the abortion facility. You know, they're about to go in and have an abortion. And as someone who has grown up uh, prayerfully protesting and being a part of the sidewalk counseling uh, mission, it's so important to uh, 
not have these buffer zones because we need to be able to get to these women to give them the facts about abortion. There are so many cases where women have chosen life for their babies right there at the door because pro-lifers are there sharing with them the truth. Uh, so we we hope that uh, you know these buffer zones are taken away so mm -hmm. that we can continue to work on this front line to protect the unborn. Absolutely. And finally, Prudence, what does it reveal, though, that the Supreme Court is punting on all of these cases? Does this mean they don't want to consider another abortion-related case? No, I think that the fact that these SCOTUS rulings, uh, that they've been punting these cases, what it really shows is that abortion law is not settled in America and that it needs to change. You know, and across the states, we're seeing pro-life laws being passed in numbers that we never have before. Mm -hmm. In Tennessee, they just passed a landmark law that has strong pro-life protections for unborn babies as early as you can hear their heartbeat. And in Mississippi, uh, they just passed a law banning discriminatory abortions based on race or sex or a disability diagnosis. You know, so the courts really need to get in line with the court of public opinion, which is overwhelmingly moving towards life. And I would also just say that this Supreme Court, you know, based on these recent rulings that we've seen on the abortion issue, has shown us just how unpredictable the Supreme Court is mm -hmm. right now. And that has shown the pro-life movement that now more than ever, we need need conservative justices on the court. And that's why groups like Susan B. Anthony List are working so hard to reelect President Trump and the pro-life Senate majority. You know, a Gallup poll came out today showing that one in three Americans uh, consider abortion to be a key issue in who they will vote for in November. So we're working hard to mm -hmm. turn out every persuadable pro-life vote so that President Trump can continue to transform the courts and especially the Supreme Court. You know, it's it's well, so important. Yes. This is a matter of life we'll, or death. We'll continue to keep our eye on the Supreme Court. Absolutely. Prudence Robertson, Communications Associate for the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves recently signed the Life Equality Act into law. The legislation bans discriminatory abortions based on sex, race, or a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. These are all significant policy goals for the pro-life movement. Mississippi lawmakers are leading the way on protecting the unborn, which brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to sign our petition thanking Governor Tate Reeves and Mississippi legislators for passing this landmark pro-life law. Here's all you have to do. Once you get to our website, you'll type in your name and some basic information to sign on to this pro-life petition. Again, Mississippi passed a bill that would accomplish significant pro-life policy goals and most importantly, save lives from discriminatory abortions. Follow the call to action to celebrate this and to encourage other state lawmakers to pass strong pro-life laws. Sign our petition by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. A stunning AP investigation finds the Chinese government is taking draconian measures to slash birth rates among Uyghurs and other minorities to curb its Muslim population. China regularly subjects minority women to pregnancy checks, forces intrauterine devices, sterilization, and even abortion on hundreds of thousands based on an AP report released last week. These population control measures are backed by mass detention, both as a threat and as a punishment. That is Zamret Dawut, a former detainee who was forcibly sterilized, telling the AP, quote, we lost a part of our body. We lost our identity as women. We will never be able to have children again. They've cut one of our organs. It's gone. Birth rates in the mostly Uyghur regions of Hotan and Kashgar plunged by more than 60 percent from 2015 to 2018. Joining us now via Skype to discuss this news is Reggie Littlejohn. She is the founder and president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, an international coalition to expose and oppose forced abortion, gender side, and sexual slavery in China. Reggie, welcome back. How is this able to happen in China? You know, Catherine, uh, things like this should not be able to happen in China or anywhere else in the world. And I believe that they were able to happen in China because China has 
convince the world that it is their friend, and then they use that as a cover to be able to pull off some of the most egregious human rights atrocities in the world today. And I believe that one of the reasons that this has come to light recently is that there are deplorable behavior during the COVID-19 crisis, delaying telling the world uh, that this is a life-threatening disease, denying that uh, the human-to-human -human transmission and all the rest of the things that they did has shown the world that they are not our friend mm -hmm. and they are, that they are not a good player. And so all of a sudden now people are focusing attention on China and we are, and these things are coming to light, but they've been going on for years. It's, it's, this is not new. This is something that's been happening for years inside of China. And I'm so happy that it is finally coming mm -hmm. to light. And Reggie, China has led people to believe they've relaxed on population control. They went from a one-child policy to a so-called two-child policy, but that's not the reality, is it? Well, that's right, Catherine. See, the way that they announced the shift from a one-child policy to a two-child policy is they said China abandons the one-child policy, and that made it look like they were abandoning all coercive population control. It, it could not be farther from the truth. And just this May, uh, they had their annual parliamentary session where they can vote on things. Of course, everybody, all these votes are, on, are unanimous because anybody who disagrees with what the party wants, you know, I mean, they, people don't dare, right, generally. But one of the things that they could have done is they could have voted the two-child policy out of existence. And there were people who are Chinese demographers that were, were criticizing the two-child policy that women, even Han Chinese today, if, if they want to have a third child, they are charged between two and six times the combined income of themselves and their husbands as a social compensation fee. And if they can't pay it, they either lose their jobs or are forced to have an abortion. Mm. And so, so that's continuing even among the Han Chinese. And now we see also with the Uyghurs, intense coercive population control under the two-child policy. And what do we need to know about these detention camps with minority women? This, this, is, this is an outrage. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing in um, the Xinjiang province, also known as East Turkestan, is that they really, what it amounts to, are, are committing genocide. What they want to do is they want, what they want to do is it seems that they want to just wipe out uh, the Uyghur population. And so even though in the past, minority women, especially in the countryside, have been allowed to have three children, they're going back now and saying, now we have a two-child policy, now we're going to enforce it. You have a third child. And so then they force them either, either to pay these fines that they can't pay, or if they can't pay the fines, they're actually literally separating parents from their children. They're putting their children into orphanages or into um, boarding schools. I read a statistic of 500,000 Uyghur children separated from their parents because their parents had too many children. And they are targeting especially people who have the belief that children are a gift from God. Mm -hmm. That's called religious extremism. And if you mm -hmm. hold that belief, they will throw you into an internment camp. Wow. Reggie, as an expert on this, is there any action you'd like to see the administration take in response? Well, when the administration heard about these, uh, these atrocities, which include women being forcibly aborted, forcibly sterilized, raped, and something that we haven't even talked about because it's not an internment camp thing, is they, they will take the husband and intern him and then move a Chinese cadre, a Chinese man, into the home with the wife and the children. I mean, the, the oppression is so, it's, it's outrageous. So the Trump administration has really taken an admirably hard line on this, and they signed into law um, the Uyghur Human Rights Act, mm. and I applaud them for that. And then on the day that this report broke last week that you're mm -hmm. referring to, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a very strong condemnation of these and called on the people and the governments of the world to rise up and cry out on behalf of the Uyghur people. Mm. Raj, as you mentioned, this sterilization and abortion effort is specifically targeting minority women in China. What should our viewers know about the Uyghur community in China? What can you tell us? 
Well, the Uyghur community is is an ancient community, and actually, um, they are they are related more to Turkey. It's also called East Turkestan. So genetically, they're not Chinese. They are Muslim. They're not Confucian or Buddhist. They, you know, they and and so the Chinese government took them over shortly after they took over uh, China, and just annexed their land, which I understand is very mineral rich. So mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there, there's an argument to be made that they are basically an occupied country. Is there anything viewers can do as they're hearing about this right now and they want to take some action? What do you recommend? Well, I, what I would love people to do is to go on my website and sign our petition against forced abortion in China. So my website is womensrightswithoutfrontiers.org. That's womensrightswithoutfrontiers.org. And then there's you can click the button that's towards the, the top sign our petition and we have already over 40,000 signatures. I would like to get 50,000 signatures and then deliver those 50,000 signatures to the Chinese embassy in, in DC. And that's how people can make their voice heard on this issue. Excellent. And Reggie, for those who are just learning of your organization, Women's Rights Without Frontiers, can you tell them a bit more of your mission and really the heart of your work? Well, I'm an attorney, uh, and when I was practicing law in San Francisco, I represented a Chinese refugee who was forcibly sterilized. And I mean, she was dragged out of her home, strapped down to a table, and had her fallopian tubes tied, all without anesthesia. This was in the mid-90s, and this is when I realized that I had heard that China had a one-child policy. I had no idea that it was enforced through forced abortion, forced sterilization, and even infanticide. And I left the law and founded this organization. So we are an advocacy organization. We raise awareness of these, of these atrocities. But at the same time, we also are the only organization in the world that has a network inside of China mm -hmm. that is actually saving baby girls from sex-selective abortion and abandoned widows in the Chinese countryside. Wow. And do you find that your work really becomes a bipartisan issue? Well, this is the thing that, like, for example, the, the Uyghur um, uh, Human Rights Act, the two people who are really advocating for it were Nancy Pelosi, um, Congressman Chris, Chris, Smith, Chris Smith, so we've got a Democrat and Republican, and Marco Rubio, Senator uh, uh, Republican. So, yes, I think that this is something that people can agree on. I think that it does, and in terms of forced abortion, no one supports forced abortion mm -hmm. because it's not a choice. So I think this is something that can draw people together in our time of, of, of so much division. Absolutely, and this really is a horrendous report that I hope um, is opening some eyes as to what's happening, and I, I am so grateful for your work and that you bring this to the light and you work uh, to bring the evil to an end. Reggie Littlejohn, founder and president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Coming up, we speak out about a story raising alarm about care for patients with disabilities. Hear about Michael Hickson, a man with disabilities who died after a hospital reportedly withheld him treatment. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A woman in Texas says her husband was denied treatment for COVID-19, was moved to hospice, then starved for six days after a doctor decided his quality of life did not merit care based on his pre-existing disabilities. That is this week's Speak Out segment. <music> Melissa Hickson of Texas says her 46-year-old husband, Michael, died on June 11th, eight days after he was admitted to St. David's South Austin Medical Center with pneumonia. He had contracted the coronavirus from a staff member at a nursing home. Hickson had pre-existing disabilities. He had developed a brain injury and quadriplegia after suffering a sudden cardiac arrest in 2017. Melissa, his wife, says she recorded a conversation with a doctor who reportedly was explaining he did not want to administer a coronavirus treatment to her husband because he did not think it would improve Michael's quality of life. Let's take a listen. As of right now, his quality of life, he doesn't have much of one. So these are the, because he's born on the brain again, he doesn't have quality of life. Correct. 
Michael had a court-appointed guardian family elder care while his wife and sister were engaged in a legal battle over who should be the permanent guardian. Family elder care made the decision to move Michael to hospice. According to his wife, while in hospice, Michael did not receive food or medical treatments and was instead given painkillers for six days until his death. The hospital strongly denies they did not believe Michael Hickson's life was not worth saving. They claim, quote, it wasn't medically possible to save him. Listen, there's a lot of details still coming to the light on this case, but I will say this. Your life is worth fiercely defending always. That's not contingent on your skin color. That's not contingent on your age. That's not contingent on whether or not you suffered cardiac arrest and now you're paralyzed and can't speak up for yourself. Your life, even if it looks different than other people's expectations, is worth defending. To prioritize stronger patients over weaker ones is a sign of a sick society. While it can seem the world is at a standstill and life is on pause amidst the coronavirus pandemic, tragically, pregnancy loss is still a reality for many women. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, we're spotlighting a group that's adapting to still serve mothers in need right now. A mom's peace is a lay apostolate for mothers of miscarried and stillborn souls. It's completely volunteer run and helps families put together a proper burial for their baby. The apostolate also helps provide Catholic guidance and support, but it's had to adapt during this time of social distancing and isolation. So this weekend, a mom's peace is hosting a virtual support group meeting for mothers experiencing pregnancy loss. Colleen Sullivan is the communication development director for A Mom's Peace. She joins us now via Skype. Colleen, welcome. Can you give us a quick overview of A Mom's Peace? Yes, thank you, Catherine, for having me, and I'd be happy to do so. You know, um, when the unthinkable happens and families learn that their baby has died in miscarriage or stillbirth, they are in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. What do we do next? To whom do we turn? Um, what do we do? And so it's in those minutes and hours that follow that they are connected with a mom's peace. And we have the privilege of guiding them through some very difficult decisions, um, providing options to them for burial or cremation, helping make funeral arrangements, and um, walking with them as well in the grief that follows the immediate loss. It's a beautiful mission. And Colleen, I have to ask you, in this time of social distancing and social isolation, how has the coronavirus pandemic impacted your group's mission in serving women right now? Good question. It's impacted all of us. Um, you know, our mission to um, help parents walk in their journey toward peace um, remains the same, but the challenges have certainly increased. Yeah. We're not letting that stop us. So what we have done is um, created some new programs to help while we are socially distant, but stay connected and still support families. Um, one of those programs um, is a garden of remembrance where we invite any parent who's lost a child in miscarriage or stillbirth to dedicate a flower in our virtual space online um, whether they lost that child this past year or whether it has been um, 40 or 50 years ago, some mothers have dedicated flowers. You can find that at our website at amomspeace.org. Um, the second big program we have initiated has been our virtual support groups. Um, of course, we would rather meet in person. It's more personable sometimes, and you can certainly have benefits to meeting in person, but when that's not safe during COVID-19, we have t um, taken our meetings virtual. And so, as you said, this weekend, we're having our first virtual meeting um, under the moderation of Dr. Sabine Heisman. She is a clinical psychologist, and she has experienced child loss herself. We mm -hmm. are uh, tremendously thankful to her for her expertise and her leadership in this area. So can you tell our viewers if they're, you know, if they're interested in, in being a part of it this weekend, what they can expect in attending the virtual support group this weekend? Yes, absolutely. So if you're able to join a support, um, a virtual support group meeting, um, you can, though it's not formally therapy, um, it's grief therapy, which is unique. And we don't, um, we don't try to take away or stop anxiety or depression necessarily, but we, we aim to create community around you and um, provide you with resources at home so that you can, um, you can be supported mm -hmm. through this. Um, 
In terms of a format for the, the meeting itself, you can expect to join our Zoom conference for about an hour. It starts with um, a presentation by Dr. Heisman um, on a topic surrounding grief. So for example, this weekend, uh, the topic is grief and its impact on the body and the brain. Um, a future meeting will be grief and trauma, and another might be grief and meditation. So after you listen to the presentation, then it will be opened up for discussion. So we invite parents who have joined us, if they're comfortable to introduce themselves, share a little bit about their story, about their loss, or if parents would rather um, not share and just listen, we welcome them to do that as well. We want this to be a very welcoming um, environment that you can do, you can participate from the comfort of your own home. That's beautiful. And of so course, after that, yeah. the, and of course, viewers can find more information at a mom'speace.org. Colleen Sullivan with A Mom's Peace, thank you so much for sharing the beauty of your work. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Well, that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, and I wanna share a little programming note. For the next two weeks, we will be airing special editions of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I think you'll enjoy seeing some of our top stories and life-affirming interviews. In the meantime, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. And if you prefer email, you can always send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.